All right, everybody. So uh, without, without further ado, uh, uh, Jenny from NOAA is going to talk to us about baselines, protection, and participation in marine conservation. So uh, thank you for your guys' attention. And, uh, and Jenny, take it away. Hey, everyone. Um, thanks for waiting on the technical glitches. Um, it's nice to be here. Um, I uh, thought, so today I was going to talk to you about a few different things. Um, we'll see how far we get with time. Um, but um, one of them is some of the work that I did in um, Monterey Bay, which is where I used to work before my current job, where I did work looking at historical changes in biodiversity. And then I thought I'd talk to you about some of my work in the Channel Islands that I work on today. Um, and uh, this, this has now just gone from a, um, a PC to a Mac, so pardon the formatting problems uh, that may or may not exist throughout the talk. <laughs> um, so one of the things that often happens when we look at ecosystems is sometimes we see places that are in really great condition and look, look like they're really healthy, and sometimes we see places that look like they're really degraded. And these are before, in a, uh, years before the work I'm going to talk about, I worked in the Philippines, so these are some of the reefs that I used to work on there. And um, so you often know that something has changed and that something's happened, but you don't necessarily know what led from the better condition to the worse condition. And that's something that's really important to understand for conservation. Um, so one of the things about change, and I think for us as scientists, is that we often assume that if things happen, we would know about them. So for example, it's reasonable to assume that if a large, common, and reasonably well-known species of marine animals or um, such as invertebrates, fish, or marine mammals were to have disappeared, we or they or somebody would know what's, that that's happened. The old they. They. <laughs> um, but can we make that assumption with confidence is something that I think is an interesting question to ask. So an example from Southern California is that there's this beautiful sea slug, which is really pretty and lives in this area. Um, but it actually, the last record of it for many, many years was in the early, mid 20th century. Um, but then, or sorry, in 1977. But then nobody noticed that no one had seen it for decades until 2013. And it was just like people just sort of assume that we know we have a finger on a pulse of what's happening, but that's not always true. And then, interestingly, actually, since, um, since this happened, now it's 10 years later. Sometime in the last like three years, it's actually started to show up on iNaturalist. So I think it actually has come back to the area. So it's sort of like an interesting that there's often these long-term cycles of species that um, that we that we may or may not be tracking, um, and which citizen science can help track, which is cool. But um, but the scenario of this long time absence of this species and others suggests that the disappearance of common, if not abundant, and relatively large and visible species might actually remain undocumented by marine biologists, including in long studied and highly accessible regions like we have here in Southern California. Um, and so one of the things that's often hard for tracking long-term change is that we often don't have historical information about it. So in this review that was done of kelp forest monitoring around the world, um, it ends up that in northern and central California, which is here um, in the red box, has one of the longest time series in the world, but is actually less than 50 years old. Um, and so that's actually, in the scheme of ecosystems, it's actually really not that long. Um, and so in order to look back through time, we have to start to think about other ways to ask those questions. Um, and having a historical perspective can be incredibly important for many different reasons. So for example, um, historical perspectives can help us understand biological losses, recoveries, or invasions of new species. Um, a historical perspective can also be used to set more accurate and meaningful baselines, which is something I'll be talking about later today. Um, it can be used to help us understand and predict impacts of climate change, and can also be used to set more accurate and meaningful restoration targets that are informed by what the ecosystem has been both in the more recent history as well as in like longer time periods. So in order to go back through time, we need to draw on a variety of different data sets which are often not commonly used in ecology. Um, so in, because in more contemporary time, we have ecological data sets where we go out and more formally monitor things, such as, but if we take that kelp forest example, that doesn't get us back very many decades. So then in order to go back further through time, we can use a variety of different methods, such as oral histories, photographs, newspaper articles, 
exploitation and trade documents, and narrative descriptions, maps, and nautical charts from people like early explorers and naturalists. Um, so when I was doing work in Monterey Bay, um, looking at changes through time, I used a lot of these different data sets to look at how biodiversity had changed in this area. Monterey is a really interesting place to work from a historical perspective. Um, there's been um, tribal people living in that area, tribal nations, for, for thousands of years. Um, but in terms of Western sort of civilization be, being there, um, it was, there was a mission that was established there in the late 1700s, and it was the capital of California under both Spain and Mexico. So there was a period where every single ship that landed in California had to clear customs in Monterey. So early on in California's history as a state, it was very, very active, both politically as well as in a maritime sense. So the ocean was really busy. And in this area, um, and in, in California, um, there, it's been impacted by people, by Western people for a long time. So for example, the, f the fur trade which came through Monterey, a lot of it came through Monterey, began to be active in the late 1700s when they discovered that there was a big market for sea otters um, in China. And, um, and then early in the 1800s, it really peaked. So that even by 1820, there was a really, already a really large decline in this really major predator. And as, as you guys probably know, um, they were more or less extirpated and s from the state. And so the remnant population for many decades was in Big Sur. And that was sort of the one place where there was lots of sea otter, or a sizable number of sea otters that were left. Um, Monterey Bay, um, uh, it's also been impacted by a lot of other things. So in the early part of the last century, there was a large fishery for sardines and later anchovies, lots of canneries. And this led to um, both changes in like populations of fish in the ocean, as well as to a lot of pollution and effluent from the canneries that affected the water. And there also have been lots of uh, temperature changes in the area too. Um, so for this project that was part of my postdoc, we we asked how coastal biodiversity in the region had changed, and we used a bunch of different methods to try and get at this, to try and understand how different parts of the ecosystem had changed. So I'm going to go through and vary in depths of, of information, a few of these. Um, so the first one that we did was doing long-term monitoring, and before I started there, um, they had redone some surveys in the intertidal, um, which is and the intertidal is biodiverse. And in Monterey, similar to here where we have um, both sort of southern species from the Baja area, and then uh, northern species that come down through the California current, um, Monterey also has the sort of at both of those types of species in the area. Um, but, um, but they're a little bit more northern. But so here's, here's uh, the, the main current systems. Um, Monterey's where the arrow is, and we're a bit south to south of Point Conception. But, um, and so this kind of leads to this a sort of general distribution of, of species that are colder, warmer, or else coast-wide. And so um, when this survey was done, it was done in the 30s by a graduate student and then sort of restarted again in the early 90s and then has been, been continued until that time. Um, and so we, we did a reanalysis for the first time since the 90s of how the species had been changing. And so um, what we found is that there wasn't, oh, the first study found is that there wasn't a change in coastwide species, but there had been a decline from the 30s to the 90s in the more northern species, and there had been a northern movement of more southern species, so there was a higher abundance of southern species, these warmer species in the area. And so um, this was really important at the time because it was actually one of the first pieces of evidence that showed that there was potentially species rain shifts under climate change. So this was like a really major, fi major finding in the 90s. Um, and so when we revisited it, um, we found that there was actually, those, some of those patterns persisted and some of them didn't. And so we found that there was a slight declines in the abundance of coastwide species through time, um, the ones that had the wide, wide ranging distributions. We found that there was continued declines in northern species, the ones that let colder water, but we actually found that there was also southern species had peaked in the 90s, and in the last decade they had actually returned to levels that had been seen in the 30s. And so if you, if you take a step back and you look at like broad scale oceanographic trends, it, I don't, you guys may or may not know, there's something called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which are sort of decadal long swings of the ocean temperature to be warmer and cooler. 
And so in the 90s, it just happened to be a really, really warm decade. And so when they started looking for impacts of climate change and they saw all these warm, warmer species, some of it was influenced by this like long, steady trend of warming, but some of it, it was higher than it might have been otherwise because it happened to be a warm decade in the ocean anyways. Which is again why it's really, another example of why it's really important to have long-term perspectives. Because something that you see over a decade time period may, might or may not actually be a long-term trend or it might just be an anomaly based on other conditions that, you, that are going on at the time. Um, so the next study I was just gonna talk about, I'm actually not gonna go into detail about just because um, of time, but um, we built to get, we did a review of ecological surveys that had been done in the area in the, like many decades ago. Um, often they were graduate students' projects or sometimes undergraduate projects, and um, we figured out which ones, that if they were repeated, would be informative for helping us understand how biodiversity had changed. And so, um, one of the things that we did was we found um, there's a, a, now, uh, somebody who's now an emeritus coral reef biologist named um, Peter Glenn, and for his PhD thesis, he had sa sampled the upper inner tidal, like the, all, all of the species, even the really tiny ones you need to get with like forceps because they're so small. And so um, for, I had a summer student, Jamie, who was shown with the arrow, who was my uh, undergrad at the time. And um, he started as a summer project and it actually turned into his senior thesis, um, repeating this project. And so I'm not gonna go into the details, but it's, it, it, it's interesting because it basically looks at things of, if the habitat changes location and you're still surveying the same place, that, that gives you different impacts. And that there was a lot of changes in different parts of the um, sort of phylogeny of things that lived in the, in the inner tidal. And so if you look just at some common species, you got one idea of what was happening. And if you looked at other species, you got a really different idea of what was happening. So it was interesting to look at all the biodiversity. So um, the next thing that we did um, was look at a bunch of archival data. And I feel like in doing this, I sort of want to introduce you to this old early histori historian or naturalist sure. whose name is William Dahl. Um, and so when he was young, he did a lot of surveys in California and also in Alaska. And so you probably have heard of him because the doll's porpoise is named after him and also doll's sheep, which are in Alaska, are named after him, as, as are many other species. Um, and so I, I like to think of him in some ways as this young man who showed up in Monterey um, in 1866, where he spent a bunch of, a couple of weeks looking around in the inner tidal and collecting animals. And so based on some of his early texts, which um, we were working on transcribing, um, you can see all these different species that he mentioned that are in the inner tidal. Um, and so this is, this is an example of like a, a, a natural, a sort of a really old text that you can use to look at what the ocean was like at that time. Um, but then I also like to think of uh, uh, Dahl as somebody who's older and wiser. Um, as he appeared in his later days, because he, he did a lot of work through time. And he came back to Monterey in the uh, 1890s, a couple decades later, and he has terrible things to say about it. So he yeah. says that um, Monterey as a collecting ground is greatly injured and will probably be nearly ruined before long <laughs> <laughs> on account of the Hotel de Monte, the new town of Pacific Grove, and the increased population of old Monterey, and all of the sewage which has turned the bay into the bay in front of the town. Beaches, and which happened through until the 80s. Beaches were formerly would afford several hundred species are now nearly bare or offensive with stinking black mud. And so if, I was, if you asked me before I did this project what the ocean was like in 1892, I would have been like pristine, healthy. <laughs> and he was like, it's a mess. But what's interesting is so when he first showed up in the 1860s, other people thought it was ruined by then. So if you go look at this guy, Chester Smith Lyman, who is a, um, he was later at Yale and he was doing also an early explorer. He talks about um, uh, in how in 1847, the ocean was disgusting. And he talks about that everywhere was covered with bones and fragments of slaughtered cattle, because there was a really large r cattle ranching in California. And the cattle, which emits a noisome smell, um, and the accolade, whoever that is, has ordered all such offal to be burned, and to a certain extent that is done. And he talks about how it's smelly and it's making the whole town of Monterey sick because it's so disgusting. And I found this painting from a simil the same year, um, which is in downtown Monterey. And if you guys know where, Mo if you, I don't know if you know where Monterey is, but the lagoon where there's like the um, Dennis the Menace Park is on the left. 
and then the the pier, um, where it's just where like the old the fisherman's wharf and stuff is, is where the second arrow is on the um, on the right. And so if you look here, where this um, cart is, there's all of these whale bones and cattle bones that are all over the beach. And so even by the 1840s, there's a lot of evidence that the town of Monterey and the beaches in Monterey were not that pristine. Um, so to then think about turning these into, like asking some questions from this type of information, um, we took archival data and oral histories and, all, and also some contemporary ecological data and asked um, a variety of questions. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about the one related to black abalone populations, which is the one, if, if you guys were at WSN, I, I did talk about this. We also did some work looking at kelp forests and sea otters and, and urchins and pycnopodia and some other things, but that's a, a, a story for another, another day. But um, so we asked, what are trends and baselines of black abalone populations in Monterey Bay, California? So um, black abalone are an intertidal mollusk that grazes, and they can live up to about 30 years. Um, the population viability estimates, which is like the minimum viable population or the number you need to have to make sure that the, it's going to sustain itself through multiple generations, is about 0.2 abalone per meter squared. But this is estimated actually over a hectare. It's like a really broad estimate and doesn't think about like sort of spatial clustering, which is common in the way that they're actually distributed through space. And in addition, there's actually no information black, about black abalone, so this estimate is based on red abalone, which which is the closest relative of black abalone that they had this information for. Um, abalone have been important through time to the tribes in California. And I thought a thing I learned through doing this project is that the word abalone actually comes from the Ohlone language, so from the, which is from the Monterey area. Um, and so kind of through time, it got translated from the original word for abalone um, into the word that we use today. Um, and the earliest records of abalone use in middens is more than 5,000 years ago, almost 6,000 years ago. Um, and that, that it's, that's in the, in the Monterey area. Um, so um, black abalone were commercially fished in the 1800s through 2003. Um, but there was, early, there was major declines, especially in the Southern California po other population, because there was a disease called withering foot syndrome that they were getting, which was making them starve and fall off the rocks. And so as a result, they were listed as an endangered species in 2009. Um, which they continue to be to this day. And they, they do seem to be recovering in Southern California. Their populations in, in Central California have gone down a lot, but they didn't get the withering foot syndrome disease. So they, um, they didn't have that same sort of stressor on their populations that we saw down here. Abalone in California history um, are, are incredibly important culturally. And I think about like my parents and grandparents, I'm, from, my family's been in California for a long time and they always talk about like how much they love abalone and eating it and it's like a major part of the culture. And you can see that there's also lots of books that are written about it. Here's a couple. There's always all these photos that just show the abundance and you might say the mountains of abalone that were present in the past. Um, and so, but a lot of um, the memories, uh, th these memories ask us so these uh, about like what the actual um, trends have been through time. So, um, the in order to look at that, we we used some um, data that was collected by um, a biology class at Cal State Monterey Bay, as well as by some other scientists. Because I work with a professor there, um, and so here's some of those students uh, collecting data in the intertidal. Um, and so they've done a mix of swath surveys and time searches. Um, using two different methods. And the time searches, I think, is interesting because in a way that's more similar to the naturalists going and wandering around for a morning in the inner tidal. So we were curious to see if, um, like, how these different methods compared. And so if we look at the, um, the transect data, which is the swath data, um, we found that there, and, and, and also, sorry, we also looked to see how abalone populations were changing through time. So um, we found that there was between zero and about two abalone per meter squared. Um, but the average through time was actually much less than what was predicted as the minimum viable population. And now we've had surveys that have been done um, 
like over more than the, like the lifespan or about like a, a, at least probably a few generations of the abalone. So um, as a result, it's, it seems like the minimum viable population estimates that are based on the red abalone may actually be too high. Although if they're, if they're at such low densities, if some, there was some major impact to them like another disease, that, that may or may not be a sustainable level. But um, so, um, uh, so then when I did some back of the envelope calculations to compare the transect, for transects where there were, or areas where there was both time searches and transects done to see how, what the relationship was. And in general, it was, there was a, a fair amount of variability, especially at higher densities, but um, there, there, seemed, there was a pretty good relationship. And so taking that, um, it seemed that about 0.2 abalone per meter squared is about roughly equivalent to 0.8 abalone per minute. And so um, then we could graph the time search data through time. Um, and then um, we can, and then if this dashed line here is what's estimated to be the minimum viable population for the time searches, we see a similar trend that they seem to have resisted at or slightly below what would, you would think would be their minimum viable population based on past estimates through, through, um, through time. And then if we look at the um, oral history data, which I'll talk about a bit, where we interviewed people who lived and worked in the ocean um, in Monterey um, over time, and we just look at this same, these same decades, um, we also found that there was just sort of this slow, steady, constant um, abundance that people talked about in oral histories. So I think the nice thing about this is that there's alignment of these three different methods and sort of the trends for the period where we have data for, for all of them. Um, but then if we want to go back further through time, we need to look at uh, use other methods. So one of the things that we did was a series of oral histories. We interviewed about 50 people um, who lived and worked in the Monterey area from 1939 to 2020. Um, and then we also used a variety of archival sources, um, such as the one we talked about with William Healy Dahl, um, to look at a change through time. And so. Um, so basically, there seems to be a period from about 1850, which is when the earliest records I could find um, were, to about 1950, where black abalone were really high and at really high and stable abundances. Um, and so this, this would therefore, although this is a relative abundance scale now because we're using all these different data sets, you'd assume based on the correlations that this would be well above their minimum viable population. And so I think it's also nice you could look at some old photographs and kind of see what that looks like. So here's some examples of abalone, black abalone being just really thickly clustered in the intertidal in the 20s and in the 40s. Um, and so I would say that this is actually, I would call this a century of abalone, which is sort of this glorious period that we think of when we think of history and the piles of abalone shells and everyone eating abalone is, is in the century of abalone. And so, um, and then and we can also see this in the oral history quotes. So for example, Ruth Anderson, who was there in the 30s, talked about them being thick. Um, some David Greenfield, who was there in the 50, late 50s, talked about them being stacked on top of each other. And John Pierce, who was also there in the late 50s, or was first there in the late 50s, says you could hardly walk on the rocks because of all the abalone. And he said you might just slip on them. There were so many. Um, but then um, after the return of sea otters, um, it seemed that, th that they likely catalyzed this decline that we see over a many decade period, over kind of a two decade period. And then we get to the more contemporary time period, which we saw in the other data sets where they've been sort of at a low but steady abundance through time. Um, and, and we know based on those other data sets that this is m hovering near or just under the minimum viable population. So then the question is, is a century of abalone a good baseline? Um, and so we have this period um, in here, but that actually skips this earlier period, which we've talked about already was really heavily impacted. And so, um, because as we, as I mentioned, otters were hunted to near extinction by, this should say the 1830s, not the 1930s. Uh, <laughs> and then um, there was also likely sedimentation and this other pollution that we, from cattle ranching and whale bones and other things that we saw from the other sources that we, we talked about. And if we actually go back even further into time, you can look at the records of and the notes of early explorers that were the Spanish 
And so, for example, um, uh, Jose Trucamada, who's on the Viscanzo expedition in 1602, does mention them. And they're pretty, so they're, they're a type of shell that people mention because they were nice to see. But he talks about being present, but he doesn't use words like we saw in those earlier oral histories about them being thick or stacked on top of each other or dangerous that you might slip on them. So I think based on this and a few other um, records from these time, I was, it seemed like they were at some, they were present, but they weren't present in that like hyperabundance that we saw in the century of abalone. So it seems like back abalone have been viable at somewhat lower than expected populations although it's unknown if they're still resilient at those low levels, if there was some, some major thing that impacted them. And the century of abalone seem, was stable, but I would argue that it's not a good baseline because it's probably not ecologically realistic. And it was likely inflated by a predator release from sea otters being gone. And the pre-colonial abundances seem to be intermediate to the, um, the, ones that, the, the abundances that we have um, today and the ones that were during the century of abalone. So um, now I want to just take a kind of a turn and um, well actually first I'm happy to take any questions about that because I'm going to switch and talk about Channel Island stuff um, mm -hmm. if, if there are any. Have questions, any abalone questions? Or historical ecology questions? Yeah. yeah. So was the black abalone the decline in the population just because of the living foot? So in Southern California, yes, that happened, but they were already declining anyway. Uh, but they declined, um, well, let me, so in Southern California, they declined in the 2000s because of the withering foot syndrome. The withering foot, you can see the disease in water if you sample the water in the Monterey area and in Central California, but the, um, the abalone there have not gotten it. So the declines in those populations probably is due to the return of the sea otter because you see this like slow, steady 20 year decline from these hyper abundances to the low population levels that we see them at today. <coughs> kind of a ride that happens like at the same time that the sea otters come back. And as sea otter populations have been going up, then this, the abalone populations have been going down. So I think that in central, Cal I think there's slightly different processes that have happened in this area and in central California. And so the signal that we're seeing here of their decline is from um, their predator returning rather than from um, dis disease. I think, in, I, I'm not a disease ecologist, but my understanding is, is that it's the presence of the withering foot syndrome plus the warmer waters. I think that, that those have been in combination causing the abalone to be more stressed and more vulnerable to the disease. So that's, they, that, that's a theory of why it's happened down here, but not further north where the waters are a bit colder. Um, the intertidal is also a harder place to be in Southern California because in Monterey it's really foggy in the summer so when you have these low tides there's things kind of stay wet because of the fog but here the, the at least by the afternoon when there's low tides things kind of get cooked so you see like just so much more biodiversity and number of species in the intertidal in Central California than you do here and if you haven't been tide pooling there I highly recommend it because it's, it's, it's interesting and very different from here. So, are the black abalone, are they more sensitive to ecological changes than like the red abalone? That doesn't seem to such a big decline. Well, there, I, um, red abalone have also declined, but there was also uh, one of the other reasons that they declined across the state, which I didn't talk about, is that there was just rampant overfishing of them. And they're really, um, and actually the book that I had up, which is it's called, it came out like maybe three years ago. It's about a history of, it's a really interesting history of abalone in this state if you're interested in it more. but. One of the things that you had is you had all these people, and in Southern California, because like a valet and Catalina, there's all there was there's just like more pressure on the ocean in Southern California, and so um, it, actually when you if you you had these people that were like flicking the abalone off the rocks with their diving knives, and that actually like, like cuts them, and then they often die. Even if you put them back, they often die. There was really really high mortality. So you had overfishing by both the commercial and the recreational fishing fisheries and then also you had even when they were they were trying to like do size have size restrictions they were they often were still dying anyways because even if you put them back they were you had injured them so that's one of I th that's I would say a more of a driver in Southern California and, and across the, the whole state they were or at least up to, up to San Francisco at least they were getting heavily fished. 
But that's a key aspect, right? It's rarely just one thing. It's like yeah. this assault and that assault and this assault and that assault. And teasing it apart is challenging. Um, okay, and and just just to check with you, Sean. You're done. Yeah. At, we're done at ten thirty. Is that right? Uh, or you go to ten fifty. Ten fifty. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. So um, yeah. So we're and again, part of the formatting. But um, so now I was going to talk about some stuff in the Channel Islands where I work today. And as Sean said, I'm a researcher for the Ch the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. Um, and the sanctuary is a type of marine protected area. And I'm not sure, have you, have you guys studied MPAs in your uh, class? A, a bit, yeah, not, not as intensely in some years, but yes, we, we've talked about it. Again. Okay, so then I won't go in great depth, but, um, but there are many, many different types of marine protected areas in the world. And effectively, it's a spatial designation that says this, this space shall be protected from X, Y, and Z. And what X, Y, and Z is varies through time. Um, and so um, there can be many different goals of what an MPA can do. So for example, there are MPAs that work to protect biodiversity. There's ones like in the sanctuary system, we have one that's just to protect whales, so that's like the goal of the MPA. Um, there's also a lot of times they're used for fisheries management. So where I used to work in the Philippines, there's lots of small MPAs that were put in place by fishing communities there as a tool for fisheries management, um, which there's also, um, they can be, put in place to protect culture and heritage. Um, the sanctuary program, one of our goals, uh, some of the, the first one was, was put in place to protect some old shipwrecks, for example. Um, and then they can also be used to restrict or promote various activities and uses of the ocean. Um, and they can also be, have different temporal restrictions, so they can just be a permanent, forever set in place. There are seasonal protected areas, so there's some, some cool examples of um, them used as a fisheries management tool, like in Madagascar for an octopus fishery is one of my favorite examples where it's closed seasonally, and then um, like, but which allows the octopus to have time to, to breed, and then it sort of helps their populations by having a period of the year when they're not fished. Um, there's also something new that's called dynamic ocean management, which is often used, is sort of been promoted for use of fish in fisheries management more offshore in the open ocean, um, which would move protected areas around based on changes in oceanographic fronts to track animals like sea turtles or some fish species like bill, like billfish that um, might be moving in spatially moving based on changes in the ocean. Um, so the Channel Islands is part of the National Marine Sanctuary System, which is a network across the United States and its territories. And so right now there's 15 marine protected areas, uh, or sanctuaries. Um, and then there's also some um, uh, national monuments that are managed through the same system. And right now we're also in the process of designating some new sanctuaries. So there's one that's under the designation process that's from Point Conception to more or less Cambria, which is the, pr the proposed name is the Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. And then um, there's the, this one, the Papahanaumokea in Hawaii is um, getting turned from a monument into a sanctuary, um, for example. And then there's some in the Great Lakes in, in New York. There's a couple. So there's, it's definitely, we're sort of in an era of the, the system growing. But it's, it's neat to work as part of the system because they're protected areas that have s uh, some shared goals and some different goals that are in a variety of different like oceans and cultural contexts. So it's, it's a cool place to work. And it's part of NOAA, just if you guys are looking for jobs, that it's like a little bit, it's a little bit smaller than like the fishery service. So I feel like as a staff member, I can, there's like a little bit more flexibility and I work on more diverse types of projects than some of my colleagues in fisheries. They get better research computers, so it's a trade-off. Uh -huh. But <laughs> um, yeah, so the Channel Islands is here, as, as you know. Um, and um, oh, that's funny. Um, and so, um, so it's close to us, and it's very beautiful. And can I can I get a raise of hands? How many of you guys been to the Channel Islands? That's excellent. Well done. And I would say, it hasn't <laughs> gone because of COVID. We have our, our trip, our, our quote unquote trip for whoever wants to go um, uh, next semester that's not associated with any particular class. So if you guys haven't gone, you definitely, if you missed out because of COVID, you should definitely come with us in the spring. <laughs>
Yeah, but it's nice to see that because a lot of people, like one of the things that's a challenge is that we're offshore and it's hard to get to and it's expensive to get there. So um, I've been, part of my job is scheming about how to make access to the sanctuary better. So I'm glad to see so many of you have been there. We've tried to make it a graduation requirement, but it's difficult with, uh, for, for us it's easy, but for other majors it's a challenge to get everybody out there. Yeah, that sounds great. I mean, especially since the university is named yeah, after yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the islands. Um, yeah, so this is what the sanctuary looks like. Um, it's the part that's in blue, the kind of bigger blue outline is the actual sanctuary. And it surrounds the islands, um, the four northern islands, as well as Santa Barbara Island, which is kind of between here and Catalina. Um, and um, so the National Marine Sanctuary System, just we just actually this year are having our 50th anniversary. Um, the the um, Channel Islands is the second National Marine Sanctuary. Um, the first one was Monitor Shipwreck, which was put in place to pre preserve an old, um, an old shipwreck. So one of the reasons that it was established here is because in um, the 60s there were, or there was a, um, the big oil spill that happened off of, off of the area, and so they wanted to protect the islands from having oil drilling being very close to them. So that was one of the, the initi initiatives of why this was put into place. Um, and so some, and some of the islands are also a national park. So we, co so we work with them, and then the ocean itself is co-managed between the state and the federal government, because the state has jurisdiction up to three nautical miles from shore, and then ours, um, ours goes from like the intertidal to, um, to much further offshore. And so, um, w as I said, one of the goals was to prevent oil drilling and pollution, and we manage things that happen on the seafloor. But the goal of the, there's, Due to some power struggles within the government, mm -hmm. um, we technically are don't we don't manage fisheries, although we are responsible for biodiversity conservation of the of the life of wildlife and pl like plants and animals that live in the sanctuary. So, you mean the sanctuary? Noah does, but but not not the sanctuary. Noah, yeah, no. So Noah does fisheries management, but the National Marine Fisheries Service and Noah, I hear back in like when we were getting going, had some arm wrestling about who was going to manage what in the sanctuary boundaries. So we, so we tend to do we do some stuff related to fisheries, but fisheries management is mostly handled by Noah Fisheries or or NIMFS. Um, and then in 2003, um, after the Mar California Marine Life Protection Act was passed, um, the state started the, the process of putting what now is a statewide network of marine protected areas in the Channel Islands was the first place where that was done. And so there's a variety of different types of protected areas in the state. But generally, there's some that are reserves with no take areas. And then there's other ones that are, cons and those are uh, shown in red. And then there's other ones that are conservation areas, which limit types of fishing, but don't prohibit all types of fishing. And so, um, uh, so there, it, there are specific fisheries management regulations that exist within the National Marine Sanctuary System, but those are um, were led by the state in, in state waters. Um, and there's been an effort uh, to kind of just extend them to the edge of the boundary so that there's consistent regulations between the state and between the federal government and the oceans that we co-manage. And then recently, um, in 2020, um, Newsom passed this goal of protecting, or the Climate Change and Biodiversity Executive Order, which is a goal of protecting 30% of the state, ocean, and, and land. Um, and so there's the effects of that and the way that it's getting rolled out is sort of like to be determined, but that is a goal of, that the state has put forth, which the sanctuary system will indefinitely be part of. And then at the same time, when something else that's ongoing is that there's currently a decadal review of the um, Marine Protected Area Network under the Marine Life Protection Act. And so, um, and as I mentioned, there's also the designation of the new sanctuary. So the, there's a lot of, um, and, and I don't have it up here, but there's also all of the, there's gonna be aquaculture, there's gonna be like wind farms, so there's all of these changes that are going on in the ocean. So it's. If you guys are interested in this, I feel like there's a lot of opportunities right now to work in these areas because there's a lot happening in the ocean in the state that will have long-term effects on how this, the access of the state, what, what kinds of in, um, infrastructure and um, like businesses happen in those state waters. Like it's, it's a really interesting time in the ocean in California right now.
Um, and so one of the things that um, I'm interested in is that humans also use the sanctuary in a lot of different ways. So my job for the sanctuary, I'm on the research team and because I work for the government, I do a hundred things, but yeah. so, some of the main things that I do is trying to think about, kind of work on setting the foundation for having a better handle on use and access and culture of the ocean in the sanctuary. Um, I also do some work related to deep sea corals and some related to climate change strategies um, for the program. But um, I thought today, because I know that um, something that uh, is done here is also ocean use and access. So I thought I'd, talk, I'd focus on the human dim dimensions part of what I do. So um, right now I'm working kind of on four projects in this area. Um, and so um, I'm going to talk about two of them because I, was, I wasn't sure how much time I have, so I figured. Um, that would be enough. <laughs> but so one of the things is, um, let's see. Um, uh, so yeah, so I've been working to develop um, on a, a many year project. It's, it's hard to do social science research within the government. The, the amount of red tape is like, I th I've, I've decided that I wonder if laws in the government were written by people that hate the government and don't want <laughs> yeah. it to function. <laughs> that's, that's one of my takeaways from working for the government the last few years. Um, but there's just a lot of red tape to be able to do like interview type of research with people. And so we got together with the Sanctuary Program, N NOAA Fisheries, the National Estuary and Reserve System, and um, uh, I think I'm forgetting one other group. But there's a, f a bunch of people in, in ONNCOS, which is a coastal research part of NOAA. So a lot of us that do research in those areas, we decided to get together to pull together a, like a really big compendium of research questions that to get them approved, it's sort of like one unified effort. And um, so I've been working on that and I've, I've been chairing the, the cultural part of that project. To, and I, I've, we've interpreted culture broadly to also include things like environmental justice and climate change issues and things that haven't traditionally been dealt with in surveys that have been done by NOAA. And NOAA sits in the Department of Commerce, and so a lot of times we have economists that look at like value of, like the financial value of things, but not all the other ways that people um, use the ocean. And so um, one of the things that I, I think, just some of the reasons I think it's important is because I think that you can have culture around the ocean and you can have management of the ocean, but if, if you work with people and understand their intersection, I think it can lead to much better management outcomes because it can help you um, identify what important ecosystem services are, which you don't actually know unless you talk to people. And then as a result, you can manage to sustain, the, um, to sustain those ecosystem services that are particularly important to people. Um, I think by, by including things related to culture and, so, and social science, you can also um, increase access um, to the ocean inclusion and all of the environmental justice and equity goals that, that happen. Um, because if you, like a, one example that comes up a lot is that um, we have all these, so it's, it's, sometimes it's more obvious with fisheries, but like we have all these management councils, we have a sanctuary advisory council, and there's also fisheries management councils for the regions. And so um, to sit on them though, like you have to spend a day of like a work day, it's not paid, it's a volunteer position. And so the people that sit on our council are often retired or professors or it's like it can be done as part of their job where they're getting paid anyways by whatever job that they do. But it's, it's hard if you were working a job where you can't take the day off to actually participate. And in the fisheries management councils, it tends to be people that have been long time involved in the fishery. And so, yes, they, they, like, the, the, um, like the rights of who has access and who has quotas and things, like those were all given away a long time ago and they tended to be the people that were there and the people that were powerful that were there. And so, it's interesting working for NOAA because in the sanctuaries is a little bit better about collecting like demographic data, but for example, um, fisheries doesn't actually collect really any demographic data, and so they give out all these permits, but they don't have records of who has fishery permits, what is their age, what is their gender, what is their ethnicity, like. That's crazy. Yeah, it's it's insane. It's like totally insane. Like they can't, they don't actually, they're not able to answer these really, really basic questions that allow you to do things related to improve inclusion and equity and all that kind of stuff. So um, to, on that front, we've been working on um, a tech memo across all the, the line offices of NOAA, including the weather service that have human facing fronts to try and promote and standardize what demographic data that we're collecting and trying and 
to push that the the agency that that deals with they're, like, they're the gatekeepers basically to push them to say that we really need to do this so that's something that I've been working on as well so these are sort of like it's not doing a survey but it's like the underpinnings of like how to do it better in the future um, which is a cool thing about working for the government so um, and then I think in addition to the equity stuff I think that um, having including c culture and understanding people's use of independence on in relationship with the ocean can also be important for supporting adaption to environmental change like impacts from climate change understanding people's ability to adapt and what might how you might be able to help them do that better if they're impacted and then also to identify and protect the non-material benefits like the fact that it makes people happy to go to the beach and just even spend time with the ocean is good for people's mental health and that kind of stuff hasn't been very well documented in a lot of cases um, included by the National Marine Sanctuary System. So these are some of the things that I sort of work on in that area and related to the question bank. Um, another thing I thought I'd mention because I think I'm excited about it is um, I had another summer student this past summer named Eva who's here um, who is an uh, undergrad at Stanford which is that's where I did my postdoc so I've um, had some students there and um, we asked we did a review of examples of federal and indigenous co-management to ask what led to better, more equitable and inclusive management arrangements. And so we did, in the review, we did, looked at 31 case studies from 52 tribes, 14 states, and five agencies, ranging from NOAA to the National Park Service. Um, and two of the examples were from the West Coast Sanctuary. So the, the word cloud is the, all of the tribes that were a part of it. Um, and so, um, we looked at a variety of different dimensions of what we considered to be important, things like access, uh, well, we looked at things like whether or not the tribe was acknowledged as having rights, like what the really attitude of the agency was, whether or not their participation was funded. Um, and then there were some other things we weren't able to look at because there wasn't enough information about them, but I think that I think are also important, things like whether or not indigenous and traditional knowledge were included in management or um, yeah, access of the tribe to those areas. Um, but those, just from, we did, this was a, like a literature, newspaper, website review, rather than interviewing people. So I think that those are important, but just weren't things we were able to look at. But based on the variables we did look at, um, our these are just preliminary results. I have to do a little bit more cleaning of the data, but um, we found that um, in areas where there's mutual responsibility between tribes and federal agencies, there was these three different pathways that led to better management outcomes. The first was having funding for tribal participation. The second was a combination of acknowledgement of tribal rights and positive agency attitude towards tribal partners. And then the third one was having a formal dispute resolution um, process. And so, um, and so what's cool about that is like right now for the sanctuary program, the reason that I, that what inspired this is that um, we're in the process of designating the Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary, though the tribal bands from the Chumash and from the Esalen tribe have been asking for co-management. And there's a lot of legal restrictions of, of that, of wh who can, because some of the tribes are recognized and some of them aren't. And the review we did was of federally recognized tribes, not because the non-federally recognized tribes is like a whole is a is a different and important question but we didn't have time to do both this summer but I think that this is like I, I one thing I like about this um, is that it's sort of like these are some um, like f like actionable things that don't necessarily like you can you can develop a dispute resolution process even if you even if there's complicated like legal arrangements and what that looks like and realizing that that's important so some of the people within the sanctuary that are kind of leading our indigenous engagement or trying to like look into some of the examples where that was and see how the other agencies like the National Parks were able to set that up. up. Um, so um, yeah, so in summary, um, I feel like I've done a lot of work to integrate knowledge, practice, and culture of people um, to help, because I think that it can, and also history of, of people in the ocean, because I think it can help improve our knowledge in a lot of different areas about ecological dynamics including more accurate baselines about uses. Oh, clearly I was writing this slide last, late last night. <laughs> Use, uses of the ocean and also about equity and ocean management. Um, and so, yeah, with that, I can take any questions. Thanks. Cool.